Yeah, but especially in some of the classrooms, like in the portables or whatever, those are pretty full. Mrs. Halsey's classroom, that's pretty full. It is full here. I have to get used to where you guys are sitting. Whew. It's warm for me. Do you know what happened yesterday? It was fascinating. My 11th graders, which usually aren't like here at <laughs> 7... 30. They were here at 7.30. Do you know why? Because they wanted to get their desks right away. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, unless you can, like, make some deal or something. I don't know. Maybe they're negotiable and so forth. I don't know. You have to, you have to come up with the right incentive. If you make the deal and, it's, and they're okay with it, then we can. Otherwise, they have... <laughs> Apparently, <they're, laughs> they have no problem with that. <laughs> Okay, you ready? Should we get started? Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? All quiet, please. Thank you. Looking forward to uh, teaching you guys. It looks like uh, you, hopefully you had a nice break um, and you're doing okay with the adjustment of being back in like mostly full-time school, but it doesn't really quite feel that way because you're in pods, you got masks on. Um, you're not able to eat, but you can drink, please do, in class. And if you can figure out how to liquefy some other kind of like s relatively solid object through a straw or something like that, go for it. Yeah, Chloe has actually got a ground up piece of granola bar in there. No, actually, she's got something liquid and so forth. Um, so just, yeah, make sure you got enough notes covered. Yeah, anyway. Um, Go ahead, take out your notes. We're going to be continuing on actually really getting started on this unit on the independence movements in the Americas. Okay, let me go through some stuff before we get too far along on that. Um, your grade. Okay, not too bad on overall on the. Um, thank you. All right. <laughs> and we got everyone on this side. Good. Okay, thanks. Um, no, that was good. Um, so, yeah, we had the, uh, the, the last test right before the uh, break, and so we're able to start on this new unit. My goal is to have two full units then before the end of the school year, which is for you guys going to be June 10th. Okay? I still only get to see you 80% of the time, which is more than I was able to see you before. And I do. I hope you guys are making the adjustments and so forth. It is a little odd, it's a little weird, and so forth, uh, but hopefully it's going to work out okay. You guys going to be okay? I mean, you've done seven full-on periods. In my class, in here, during the time period, it's going to be as it was the expectation of taking notes. So you want to take good notes and get ready for, like, the tests. So we've got two more tests coming up for this year, okay? One on this unit, Independence Movements on the Americas, and then the next one will also be focusing on the Americas and the time period just after that. Okay? Um, as a reminder of things that you will need to do, one, to help get yourself to get the grade up, do keep track of Google Classroom. Because in Google Classroom, you see, actually, raise your hand. Somebody tell me. What opportunity do you have in Google Classroom, based on stuff I put on there on Monday, to get some more points? Jacob. The what? Oh. So, and actually, I think, I don't know if I put that in there yet because we have the quiz next time you guys are in here, right? Chapter 7, that's going to take place in here. There is going to be the opportunity for the retake. And I don't know if I put that in there yet. Did I? Anyway, the opportunity for the retake. Some students... Um, they just do it automatically. Some of you guys actually were doing this automatically. You write out two sentences. <clears throat> you write out two sentences for each of the component parts. That not only helps you get ready for the uh, quiz, but then you can hand it in to me and know that you're going to have 1.5 points for the retake already like in the bank. Does that make sense? 
okay? Because some of you guys did that last time. For the test, raise your hand if you can tell me, as a retake for the test that I think everybody here except for one uh, person who's going to because they were gone before the break, that's cool. Uh, what opportunity do you have to make up those points? Nobody? I put it on Google Classroom, yeah. Yeah, there's some essays. Yeah, a couple of, I think there's a couple of small essays, maybe even just one small essay, because uh, it was a fairly small test. Does that make sense? Look on Google Classroom. If you get the essay thing in, that would be good for like three, three and a half points. It's fairly quick to boost that up. Otherwise, I would say um, continue doing what you're doing. If your grade is doing pretty well, if you're able to take good notes, if you're able to prepare for success on my test, great. Keep that up. I will have two quizzes for this unit. The first one's coming up Friday. I think that I posted the one already for the next one, and that's going to be on Wednesday the 14th, and that'll be on Chapter 8. The one thing you probably really, really want to focus your attention on, and some people are just really, so, I've already got one in here. I've got one. This person is apparently, I'll look at it here and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I think I wanted you to put word count on there too to make sure. Wow, that's a memory. 1,000. Do you want to? Do you want me to give it back to you so that you can find out the exact number? Because when is it really due? You literally said it was due on Friday. I didn't. I use a variety of ways of providing the information. One, old-fashioned, I put it on the board. I also put it in Google Classroom. And I believe I've also got it on PowerSchool, in the grade component thing there. So no worries, no worries. It actually is good. The benefit of, <laughs> the benefit of actually having it done before it's due is you don't have to mess with it as much, except for the word count. The, the downside of uh, having the wrong date is if you think it's due after, then it's late, and then that's not good at all. OK, everyone get theirs? All right, good. Excellent. All right. I would say, for your sake, and I mentioned this before, and I'll answer this question, and I appreciate since it is such a bigger group and so forth, since you're not like six feet away and so forth, attention to me. Put your hands up just for the case of, of doing that. But I'll answer the question. Aim for that. If it ends up being a little bit more, I'm not going to like ding you too much for it. If it ends up being like a whole bunch less, that will be ding worthy. Okay? I've got juniors and seniors who are doing their um, IAs, their history IAs for IB, and the word count is no more than 2,200. And I tell them to get it like between 2,100 and 2,200 because that's like the sweet zone, but they can't have it over 2,200. So when I give you the 1,500 like cap, it's kind of to get you in the practice of doing a good job of getting the right words to get right up until that amount. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. I know it doesn't. <laughs> it's tough because honestly, sometimes people will get these papers, and they're like, this is so cool, I'm finding all kinds of really good stuff and so forth. I'd say, you know, if you're 100 or 200, 300 and so forth, it's not too bad. Okay? Don't be much, much under, for sure. In fact, hit it. You know, try and aim for it. Okay? Anybody have any difficulty questions and so forth with respect to their um, film critique? Because you guys got off into a good start on that with the preliminary thing. And um, I know we've got Elliot in here now because of schedule changes and so forth, and he gets to do that. And don't worry, I'm not going to take your movie away from you Ellie is going to get a brand new, fresh movie, and it'll be awesome. In fact, there is another version of Mulan. Just kidding. I've got two people doing Mulan, right? Who are the two people doing Mulan? Raise your hands. Which one do you have? Is it the good one? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> wow. Wow. I don't know. The live action was pretty good, but you like, you like, the, you like the animated one better. Yeah, that was... So... But there's a lot, there's tons and tons and tons of good movies to, to do. And so we'll get Elliot uh, his assigned um, tomorrow when we meet him at lunch. Okay? Um, 
Yeah. I'm having high uh, expectations and so forth of you guys continuing to do what has already been well established. It was fascinating because, <laughs> um, have you noticed any difference in like the classes and so forth? Let me just ask you guys. Um, today and yesterday, um, is there more chatting going on in class? What do you think, Vinny? Is that okay? Really, what does it depend on? I don't know. What's too distracting? That's a good question. If it's sort of like, you know, I'm talking to Ellie and doing all this stuff at the beginning of the class and so forth, and everyone's chatting and so forth, that's all cool and everything. What would be your answer if I'm giving instruction? Is any distraction okay? So it's much easier when people are six feet apart. Because if I'm right next to somebody who I like, and presumably most of you guys are next to people you're like, it's okay, I won't call anybody out. Okay? I mean, you know, you want to maintain the... Oh, no, I can't stand it. Just kidding. I mean, you're like, oh my gosh, this pod, every single... How many of you guys are in a pod with the same people for eight periods? Seriously? Because you've got the same, like, electives and stuff. Yeah. Um, but the tricky thing is, is if you, because I know people, I mean, you guys are cool people and everything, but if you are next to somebody, the temptation is a little bit greater. And so I'm going to ask for your continued discipline and restraint. So when I'm doing instruction, to not do that. Right? Your job is to type it out, handwrite it out, and so forth to get the thing. And I think that's going to work out really well. And to be honest, um, I've liked how it's been worked out so far this school year with you guys both the Green Day and the Blue Day, and the at-home folks, that worked out really well with them. They were never a distraction. So if that can continue on, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you in advance. Because if it's not, then you get to see a little bit of a different side of your instructor. OK? Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, and probably I would say with smaller classes, it's a little tougher because smaller classes, um, it's a little bit more flexible as far as like the hands up and so forth. Um, in here, you know, put the hands up or I'll call on you because I, I know all you guys' names. And I want you to participate and so forth on all these kinds of things. Okay. Are you ready? It's also warmer in here. Good grief. Um, let's get to the beginning of this unit and tell you the importance of this unit. This unit, are you ready, is American Independence Movements. <clears throat> and it covers predominantly the independence of, I don't know, one of the most important countries in the world, us, exactly. And you guys probably do know something about American independence, right? Do you know where the Declaration of Independence was signed? Yeah, you're like, at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> that's where it was signed, at the bottom. Do you know what city it was? Does anyone know what city the Declaration of Independence was signed in? Oh, you know the building! What's the building? Oh, I like that. That's a good name for it. Was it called Independence Hall before the Declaration of Independence was signed in it? I think it had a different name. I don't know. I forgot the name of the thing. So what city was that in? Philadelphia. What state? At the time, what colony? Yeah, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, PA. Okay? So that was, was that the first capital of the United States of America? See, who did, who did we, you didn't get that one. Who did we get our independence from? I'll give you a clue. We spoke the same language. It works, yeah. England, yeah. England, yes. Britain. You write that down. The United States. We'll get our independence from Britain. Woohoo! You got that? So in here, what we do is you want to have an area for taking notes. We do a lot of note taking in here. So you can use it on regular paper. Do you have like regular paper and so forth? Oh, no. Do you want to have a little piece of paper today? Yeah. Otherwise, because like some people use like spiral notebooks, spiral notebooks, you can use a computer. Have you guys doing notes on a phone? 
You can do notes on a phone. You want to, you got a computer. Um, to start off, you can do, here's some paper. So you want to take the notes on this very carefully. As we go through here, okay, because they're all very diligent and so forth on that. So we've got the name of the unit, and it's also very helpful. In fact, I would say, especially today, take out the handout that I gave you. Turn over to page two in the handout that that's going to, did I give you one yet? No. Okay. Did you get the study guide for the quiz? You need to be more assertive and say, Mr. Hanson, come on, I just got back here. Give me a break. This is the quiz we're going to be having. Okay, so you're going to take a real quiz. And you've done some of those before. And this is the handout for this particular unit. So, <clears throat> page two, you got that? So, page two, not the front, page two. Uh, because I'm going to be taking you through all these various different points. And if you have it, great. If you don't, you can look on on someone to kind of see page two. Yeah, it's okay. No worries. Um, so that you can see, like, when I go through, I'm like, blah, 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 Hutchinson. And you're like, Hutchinson? How the heck do you spell Hutchinson? Well, it's the third line down. There's Hutchinson. We'll be talking a little bit about Thomas Hutchinson. So, second page, yeah. So the back of the front sheet. Very good. Okay. The stuff on the front is to give you an idea because, oh, it seems early. You're in high school now. In fact, I was, remember, I was talking to one of the other high school teachers, and they're like, I think the ninth graders are going to have a little bit of an adjustment with this whole new schedule uh, because it's like, whoa, you're in school every single day, except for Monday. It's still 20% off, and it's a high school kind of a thing. So how many of you guys were able to like, get a fair amount of homework done at various different times during the school day on your day off. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's good training. So you would have that. And so you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to go to school until 2.45, and then I've got to do homework? So that's a little bit of an adjustment there. For me, I would say it's going to be pretty much the same kind of thing. If you're in a good shape on your film critique, great. A um, couple of quizzes, maybe, for each unit. But other than that, the best thing to do going forward for like these big tests Raise your hand if you can tell me, what's the best thing to do going forward to prepare for big tests? That's it. Yeah, just look through your notes on a regular basis. That's good advice, actually, and sometimes people pick up on that right away, and then they don't have to cram a lot the night before the test trying to go over a lot of material that's going to show up on a test. So it's good practice. Take a little bit of time. I know it's kind of tough because you've got some other various different things, and trust me, as you move forward in high school, you don't have to do it all right away. But as you move forward, and some of you guys know you've got older siblings. Have you, how many of you got older siblings? What do they tell you? The workload less or more? Yeah, generally is more. Generally. Like in areas like English history kind of stays about the same. I, bra I ratchet it up just a little bit, you know, until you're out the door. Okay? All right, um, so here we go. We're going to talk about the independence. We'll be spending a lot of time talking about the independence of America, the United States of America, and then we'll get to the independence of the others. And it's all part of this. Here's the IB unit. It's on the front there. I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about that on the front. That's sort of more for you later on where it says, save these notes for IB exams at the end of senior year. That seems so far away. My current seniors, actually, I didn't even know my current seniors when they were freshmen. My current juniors, I knew when they were freshmen. That seems like a long time away. But one of the things that I've done over the years that's worked out very well is packing in and introducing IB history material and practices early on so that by the time people are doing their IB exams senior year, they're in much, much better shape. So it's good to do that, right? If you're in high school, how many of you guys are thinking of going on to college? Raise your hand if you want high school to prepare you for college. Raise your hand if you want high school to just be so, so easy that college will just be, I don't know, a surprise when you finally get there. Yeah, just surprise me. <laughs> you know, I'll take these college classes and they're like, oh my god. <laughs> and I've actually, that's, seriously, there's been North Star students that have come back and they go to college and they're like, wow, some of my like, roommates and classmates and so forth are like, 
I have to do what? I have to do how many papers? <laughs> and then North Star suit's like, I did this all at North Star. I'm going to take a nap now. I mean, seriously, that's one of the payoffs. You can take nap in college because you already know how to do it very effectively and efficiently. So yeah, we'll continue. I'll be continually working with you guys and other teachers over the years to um, get you ready for what's coming next. Because it sucks to not be ready for something big and important like college. Because do they give you your money back if you fail out freshman year? <laughs> You're laughing. No, they don't. They don't. So you want to go in prepared for what's going to happen in life. Whether it's college or adulthood, don't rush it. Don't rush it. You know, take your time, one day at a time. Okay? And in fact, speaking of adulthood and relationships between, I don't know, parents and children, write this down. Britain has been correctly identified as the parent. And who are their little children? Well, there's 13 little colonies. In fact, do you want to go ahead and we want to give it a shot and try to identify the little colonies that we have? The 13 English speaking colonies. North America. It's almost like they're little children. They sent the people off there and they settled in the colonies and it was like, oh, this is so exciting. And there they are and the parents in Britain are like, oh my gosh, you're doing so well. Let me ask you guys, um, how many of you guys still want to be in the same situation that you are in with your parents as far as like they make most of the rules, they provide the food and transportation and clothing and shelter um, 10 years from now. So I've actually heard some students going, I like it. It works out pretty well. How many of you guys think that you might? How many of you guys know people that have, that there are parents that have, because you guys are what, like 13, 14? You're 15. Oh, oh yeah. So well, let's say you're 25 years old. You're 25 years old. You're ancient. Oh my gosh. You've got gray hair. If it hasn't fallen out yet, just kidding. You're 25 years old. Do you want to be at home under the same rules that your parents have right now and under the same relationship? Raise your hand if you would like to be a little bit more independent. That you think by that time you will have developed some skill sets and so forth and wherewithal so that, Vinny, you can. You can pay your bills when you're 25. <laughs> you're like, what kind of bills am I going to have? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you're like college loans and... But you want to be a little bit more independent by then, right? Is that where you're moving forward to? Good. Good luck with that. Right? So here we go. Write this down. 13 colonies that the British will have in North America. 13 of them. And they were established, I don't know, give me a century. What century were they first established? I mean, let me see. What was the first English colony in uh, North America? Jamestown, it located in the larger colony of, named after Queen Elizabeth, Elizabethia. Virginia, very good, write that down. Virginia was the very first colony. Boom. I know we're not doing it all geographically and everything, but give me, a, give me like a rough date of like, when was Virginia founded? When was Jamestown founded? Are we talking about the 1300s? Let me see, that would be before 1492. And everyone knows in 1492, somebody sailed the ocean blue and they bumped into a continent that they weren't expecting. That was Columbus, and he was working for Spanish. The British established, do you know this one? It, yeah, very good, like give or take a couple of decades. Because I was, I attended college at William & Mary, which is just down the road from Jamestown. And so I think it was like 1619 or something thereabouts, but it was way early in the 1600s. Okay? Raise your hand if you can tell me. What was the second colony that was founded? I'll give you a clue. We sort of celebrate Thanksgiving associated with these guys. And it's not Virginia. Some of them are like, should we go to Virginia? They're like, no, there's too many people we don't like down there. We're trying to get away and do our own religious thing sort of in a separate area. Anybody know? Right, which would be part of the colony of Massachusetts. Write that down. The second one is Massachusetts. And you're like, what the heck, Massachusetts? Do I have them all written out there? Yeah, <laughs> how do you write Oh, I didn't include Massachusetts. M-A-S Massachusetts. M-A-S period. Okay. Massachusetts. Okay. So those are two. Those are actually going to be very important. So those are the oldest colonies. We'll talk about some very important people from Virginia 
In fact, look up. Raise your hand if you can tell me. Which of the first six people among the presidents of the United States under the United States Constitution, raise your hand if you can tell me, which of the first six people were from the colony state of Massachusetts, or excuse me, Virginia? Washington and Jefferson, very good. Madison, very good. He's going for the fourth one. It's not an Adams. <laughs> You're like, that takes care of two. So it's Monroe. Yeah, so one, three, four, and five. Four of the first six presidents of the United States of America under the Constitution were from Virginia. Virginia was the biggest colony. Write that down. Is the oldest colony it's the biggest colony? Virginia. That's where I went to school. When I was five years old, my dad, Orville Hansen, was elected to the United States House of Representatives. We packed up the car in the winter, and dad drove it. We went on the plane. Me, my mom, my brother, the cat, the dog, and five sisters. And we arrived in Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., which was named after Washington. And so that's where I grew up uh, in the early years, coming from Idaho. I came back after I went to college. So we got Washington, we got Jefferson, we got James Madison and James Monroe. You can write this down if you want. John Adams and John Quincy Adams were from Massachusetts. That's another fairly good sized colony. The second oldest. Massachusetts. In fact, let's start out in that area. Those of you guys who are fans of the <coughs> former team of Tom Brady can tell me what that general area around Boston, Massachusetts is referred to as. It's New England. And New England, you can write this down. The New England colonies include Massachusetts. Just north of that is New Hampshire. And again, those are, these are all going to be established around like the 1600s, late 1600s. I think they pretty well wrap up by the end of the 1600s. Yeah, New Hampshire. Up in, as far as like not the order of the colonies, we're just sort of doing geographically now. Okay? And then just south of Boston, there were some people that were like, we don't like those Massachusetts people. We're just going to like move over here and settle. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Still a fairly small community one of the smallest states. Just to the west of Rhode Island is going to be a very important state. Connecticut, or as I sometimes say, Connecticut, which helps me to remember that there is an extra C. Connecticut. Those are the New England colonies, New England states. But the New England Patriots are officially located in Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Yeah, and they used to have a like a, an unbreakable streak of like Super Bowl wins or yeah, yeah, whatever. New York. Write that down. Moving along as we continue south-ish. New York, which used to be called New Amsterdam. So the English got from, where's your hand if you can tell me, what country used to control New Amsterdam and then it became New York when the English took charge of it? It wasn't the French, but... The Dutch, yeah, the Dutch. Yeah, so the British were sort of like, hey, Dutch, <laughs> you guys want to like go somewhere else or so forth? We're going to like uh, establish ourselves here. Continuing south from New York, New Jersey. New Jersey, okay? New Jersey? Yeah. If you, have you guys ever lived in New Jersey? That some of the people are like, You're, are they seriously, they, they talk that way? Do they talk like New Jersey? Yeah, a little bit, sometimes, yeah. And then what is just west of New Jersey? Pennsylvania. Okay, that was a pretty good sized colony at the time. <coughs> that's going to be, um, that's going to be where Philadelphia is located. So we've got some big cities, Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New York, New York. That's only seven? Oh, no, I'm sorry. The New England colonies is just Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Yeah, 
If you're from New York, you're like, we're not from New England. What are you talking about? We're from New York. Yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just kind of like the ones that are like here, they're sort of called the mid-Atlantic. When we get into like south of Pennsylvania, in fact, you can go ahead and mark this. The, bo the southern border between Pennsylvania and the state just south of that, it's called Maryland. Okay? They actually refer to it sometimes. There were two counties there, and one of them was like Mason. Dixon. Like, okay, well, that's cool. The Mason Dixon line, what the heck? It runs east west. I'm like, why is that important? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you it's important because eventually, in the northern colonies, northern states, go ahead and write this down. Let's see if we can figure this out. In the northern states, they're going to be like, we don't do that here anymore. They do it in the southern states, but we don't do it here anymore. We don't need, we're, we're, we're against that sort of thing. We don't need that sort of labor. Have you figured it out yet? Yep. Slavery, exactly. Pennsylvania and north is going to ultimately be no slavery. Okay? And even in the early days, there wasn't much slavery because mostly people who set up farms and so forth in that area, they're like, we don't need a lot of slaves. We're not going to be doing big plantations and so forth. That was more of a southern thing. And when I mean southern, we mean Maryland on the way down south. Right next to Maryland, not to be forgotten, sometimes referred to as the first state, as in the very first state to adopt the United States Constitution. It is the home state of our current president, Joe Biden. Delaware, there you go. Little Delaware, it was small then, it's still small. It's one of the smallest states in the country, okay? In fact, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that Joe Biden is the very first president of the United States from Delaware. Yeah, it's a small state. But Idaho's never had a president of the United States. So we got Delaware and Maryland, both slave states. Continuing south, we got Virginia. We've already talked about Virginia. Virginia's the first state. Okay? Continuing south of that, anybody know? I know it's hard to read there. Anybody know? Just they know because they've been back east. Anybody grow up back east at all? No? It's the state where the first flight, human flight, took place. Orville and Wilbur Wright. North Carolina. Yeah. They literally, they have it on their license plate. North Carolina, first in flight. One of my William and Mary uh, Civil War pro professors was like, yeah, that talks about their Confederate armies because they sucked. As in, they retreated when they got into a battle. They were like, he was dismissing the North Carolina, as in first in flight, running away from the battle. Thanks. It wasn't that funny. South Carolina is just south of? Good, good. South Carolina is just south of North Carolina. Oh, you guys are brilliant. And that was an early colony, going to have the port city of Charleston. You can write that down. So as far as like important cities, we got Charleston in South Carolina. I mean, Maryland, actually, see if you can figure this one out. There's a very important port city in Maryland. They got uh, my favorite baseball team growing up in Virginia because they didn't have the Nationals yet. They didn't exist yet as a baseball team. But in Maryland, those of you guys who know sports, yes? Charleston. Charleston. Okay. Named after King Charles. Um... Help me out. What is the largest city in the state of Maryland that's got a baseball team named the Orioles? Yes? Baltimore. Baltimore, that's right. And they also have a football team named the Ravens because Edgar Allan Poe was from there and he wrote a poem about the Raven. So they named a football team after it. And finally, last but perhaps least, just kidding, last but not least, Georgia which was a relatively small state back then. Today, it's a pretty significant state. Georgia, at the time, was transitioning from its original purpose. In Britain, if you were in trouble with the law, they might give you a choice. Which choice would you take? You have been convicted of stealing a loaf of bread. Your choice is hanging or banishment. Okay, there you go, banishment. I mean, that seems like a pretty tough penalty. Banishment to where? Well, when Georgia was a colony, it was a prison colony initially. 
-hmm. Yeah, so whenever you run into somebody from Georgia, you go, ah, you guys used to be a prison colony a long, long time ago. Raise your hand if you can tell me this. This sort of like checks to see if you really, really know what happened when Georgia gained its independence along with the rest of the uh, uh, United States. Where did the British send prisoners after that? <laughs> the ocean. Oh, that's nice. It is. It's very good. It's Australia, which is a really long journey. I mean, they went, I mean, previously it was to like Britain, to Georgia. They just sort of drop them off there, like, or whatever. But then later, it's like they go all the way around the southern tip of South America, across the Pacific Ocean. They arrive at Australia, and literally, the initial ones, they just dumped on the shores of Australia. Australia became the new prison colony for quite some time thereafter. I want you to understand this, because I use the analogy of parent and child. And for you, 10 years seems like a long time. But honestly, when you're 25 years, do you think you're going to have enough wherewithal to maybe, perhaps, be somewhat independent? Maybe, yeah. I mean, you'll be mature enough. You're going to be smarter and so forth. And hopefully you guys will. If not, but, you know, if your parents are like, uh, well, we'll help pay for this, this, this. And you're like, okay, that's good. But here's the deal. These colonies, write this down. These colonies were established in the 1600s for the most part. And the events that we're going to be talking, taking, talking about taking place, like the Declaration of Independence, where the 13 states are like, yeah, we declare independence. Huh. Anybody know what date the Declaration of Independence was announced? July 4th. Very good. You can write that down, July 4th. Why, is that, why would you remember that date? Oh, that's right. It's Independence Day. Wow. Yeah. Because of the movie. Yeah, I remember that day because it's the movie. Because my mom, who grew up in Britain, they do not have a July 4th. They, have, they put July 3rd twice on the calendar. You know I'm kidding. No, they, 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 yeah. But they don't have a July 4th celebration. Why would they? What year? Nice. Write that down. 1776. 1776. Colonies are declaring themselves independent states after having existed as colonies for some of them almost more than 150 years. Do you understand that? Now, this is pretty radical. Write this down. It is very radical for colonies to declare themselves independent. I'm like, I don't care how long you're a colony. You're still a colony. You're still a kid of mine. And you're still going to follow the same rules that I've adopted all this life. When you're 35 and you go back to visit your parents, what rules are going to apply to you? <laughs> you're like the ones that you had when you were in ninth grade. And you're like, but mom, I'm going to I'm, 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 I'm going to stay out. I'm going to visit. Her. Where are you? I'm worried about you. I'm going to stay up for you. You're like, oh my God, really? Seriously? Anyway. Um, so here's the deal. And this is very important you write this down. When these colonies were established, this is not like they're set up in the backyard where the parents can kind of look and check in on them and so forth. The key thing I want you to write down here is these 13 colonies are established as almost semi-independent colonies. They are reliant on themselves in a large degree to take care of themselves. Here's an analogy. This would be like your parents saying to you, I'm going to send you off to another state. Here's some food. Here's a phone. Here's some resources. Good luck. Do you understand that? How many of you guys would be like, that'd be pretty hard at first. How many of you guys think you could survive? Well, was there a choice? I mean, literally, look, you've got an ocean between Britain, and then you've got all these things here. Even if you've got it kind of going back and forth and so forth, you've got a time gap. Put this down. The colonies liked being part of this British empire. They liked being a colony. They liked being British. But you know what they also liked? They also liked being in charge of a lot of the day-to-day -day operation. In fact, here is one thing that you have to, you have to write down, because this will help you to understand. Because there's going to be some problems coming up here. We're going to see colonies being dissatisfied and declaring independence and fighting a war and winning. I mean, it's like you saying to your parents, I hate you. I'm leaving now. Boom! Slam the door. 
How many of you guys anticipate that that's going to happen like within the next several years of your life? I'm not listening. I'm not watching. Anyway, that would be really bad. And it was quite unsettling. But that's what kind of happened. Because here's the deal. These colonies, write it down, they were taking care of their own business. They had colonial governments. Write that down. They had colonial governments. And who picked the people in those colonial governments? They did. If you were in Virginia, you chose people to represent you in the city of Williamsburg. That's where the College of William and Mary was set up. That's where I went to school, with Thomas, not at the same time as Thomas Jefferson. But that's where they gather their colonial government. Did they, t did they put taxes on the people in Virginia? Yes, write that down. If you were in Virginia, you paid taxes to Virginia. Who set those taxes? The people who you chose to be your Virginia government representatives. Do you understand that? And if you didn't like the taxes, you complained to them. Maybe they rose them, maybe they lowered them, but, or you voted them out of office. That's how you did it. Does that make sense? Because if you understand that, you're going to see something's going to happen that's going to go awfully wrong, and there's going to be a war of independence. You got that? Okay. They liked having their autonomy. Do you know that word, autonomy? How many of you guys would say right now you've established a situation in your families where you've proven um, that you are fairly responsible, reliable, trustworthy, tidy, um, that you've been given some more autonomy than maybe you had last year or several years before that? How many of you guys would say, or here's a real kicker, how many of you guys would say that you have proven that, but maybe the autonomy is not given to you quite yet, but maybe it should be, and you're trying to figure out a way to <coughs> communicate that? That would be really nice, right? It's a touchy kind of thing, because you can't just go home and go, Mom, Dad, I want the car. You're not using it. Hand it over. Fork it out right now. And you're like, but you don't even drive yet. Doesn't matter. I'm tall enough. You know, I can put my foot on the uh, accelerator. There you go. Yeah, I can take care of business. So these guys that were living in these 13 colonies had pretty well proven that they could run business pretty well. Right? And in fact, put this down. More and more English people kept coming over. More and more English people kept coming over into the colonies. And when they arrived, it's like, welcome. <laughs> and they looked, these new colonists were like, whoa, that's great land. And the colonists that were there already would go, that's my land. Well, I want some land too. Yeah, you can have some over there. Which direction would they be pointing? West. They would be pointing west. Here you can kind of follow this. You've got the eastern seaboard, the original colonies. New colonists arrive. The original land has been taken already by the original colonists, which, by the way, they took it after having uh, <coughs> broken the Thanksgiving tradition with the native population and continued to sort of push the native population. But that's going to be a trend in American history, if you haven't noticed already. The more people of European ancestry arrive and the, the bigger the United States and so forth grows, it's going to put some really big burdens on the native population. Okay? And so, understand that. Write this down. After a while, and it doesn't take too long, Native Americans, <laughs> they start to really not like more people <laughs> showing up. Because when the new people show up, what do they want? They want land. Yeah, they want land. They want to be able to sustain their families and so forth. This is going to create some really interesting situations, some really interesting dynamics. And if you are a native people or an Indian, whatever you want to call, if you're those people, you're like, what do we got to do to get rid of these people? <laughs> Can we just like push them back into the ocean? Not going to happen. In fact, if anything, you're going to be pushed all the way back to the other ocean on the other side of North America. It's not going to be a real positive relationship going on. But here we go. New colonists arrive, and they're told, go over to the West. Well, who's living over in the West? Native Americans. 
And what are the Native Americans' attitude to these new English colonists coming over and settling in their neighborhoods? They don't like it, and they're starting to resist quite a bit. And let's add this other group. Are you ready? The French! Write it down. The French! Who invited the French to North America? <laughs> they weren't waiting for an invitation. They wanted colonies in North America, too. Well done, France. Let me see. You've got one colony down here, Louisiana, named after King Louis, called New Orleans, based on the old French city of Orleans. So you've got Louisiana, and then you've got Canada, Quebec, Montreal. You've got French up there in Canada, and take a look here. Blue is representative of the French claims in the uh, North America at the time. You've got French beyond the mountains, and they have control in there. But write this down about the French. They didn't bring that many people over. It's not going to work out very well for them in the long run. They didn't have as many colonists. As you start getting into the 1700s, you know, after a while, you get a lot more English colonists than you have French colonists. I mean, the French is kind of like, we're in France. We love France. Why get another boat and go across the ocean? It's not France. Well, who would go on a boat among the French to go across the ocean? Some settlers, a lot of uh, trappers, people that would like hunt for beaver and other animals in North America. What the heck? What kind of marketplace would want a bunch of dead animal pelts? Who wants dead animal pelts? You guys want a dead animal pelts? Taylors, who? Where is it fashionable to wear beaver? In Europe, write it down, seriously. Europeans loved North American beaver pelts and other animals, but particularly beaver. And so the French, they were interested, and they were going all up and down in here, and they were hunting for beaver and various different animals and so forth. You know, and some of the Native Americans are like, let me see, do we like these Frenchies coming around and killing these animals and taking them off so people can wear hats in Paris? No, but you know who we really can't stand? Write it down. Native Americans, after a while, they really couldn't stand the English. Write it down. Why do they hate the English? Why do they hate the English more? Why do they hate the English more than the French? They want the land, yeah. The French come in and they want to like hunt the animals, trap the animals. But the English want to come in and take over the land. And when you lose the land, I mean, you've lost everything. Oh, there's all kinds of things. I mean, it's like pile on the different kinds of things. It's like Native Americans weren't really keen about any of these Europeans coming over because they're like, because it changes everything. I mean, they already had issues before the arrival of the Europeans with other Native American tribes. But I mean, <laughs> those look like easy things compared to when all of a sudden you got all these Europeans arrive and all these English speakers. So you had eventually some fights, write this down. You had some fights break out along the frontier. And depending on who you talk to, who's responsible for why the fight took place and who's responsible for fixing the fight. Listen very carefully because you're going to end up with a lot of different opinions and these different opinions are going to lead to ultimately the American War of Independence. Do you see the difficulty here? Do the French want English settlers to come over the mountains and settle into territory that the French have claimed? No. Write that down. The French do not want those English settlers there. By the way, they're not all English. Sometimes you get German speakers that come over and they want to settle in the English colonies and the English are like, fine, sure, you can come in. The French don't like it. Who else doesn't like it? The Native Americans. But if you've got all these new colonists in these English colonies in Virginia and Maryland, and they're sitting there and they're like, I want some land. I'm going to go over. And so they go over into that territory and fights break out. Native Americans are fighting off these new colonists. The French aren't happy with these new colonists coming in. And who do the new colonists turn to for a little help? You're like, well, we can do our taxes and we can run our economy and so forth, but, you know, we need a little bit of muscle here. 
Who's got some muscle that can help new English colonists settle into new land with peace and security to keep those French and those Native Americans at bay? Who can do the, who can do the job? Who's the most powerful? Who is a really big, powerful country that's got a military and really cool redcoats and... Yeah, the British people, like the British Army? Yeah. yeah, write that down. The British Army. The colonists call for help from the British Army to help them out. Now, the colonists are not completely flakes. Do the colonists not have guns? This is America. Are you kidding me? Do colonists have guns? Yes. What do they use their guns for? Hunting. Neighborhood protection, especially if your neighborhood is along the frontier and you're afraid of incursions by Native Americans. And do those colonists sometimes form up into like groups of community soldiers? What's a group of community soldiers referred to as? Militia. Very good. Anybody got how to spell militia? It's going to be a very important word to know. It's actually in the Constitution. It's in the Second Amendment. M-I-L-I-T-I-A. Militia, it's pronounced militia, okay? So they form up like colonial militia. So those are like local military units. Is that enough, those colonists in their militias to get the job done? I don't think so. They need the muscle of Britain. And this is where things get really interesting because a big war is gonna break out in North America. It's called the French and Indian War, okay? And it takes place between, uh, let me see, this, it, it's uh, 1756 to 1763. Write those dates down. 1756 to 1763. The French and Indian War in North America. What do they call that same war that's not taking place in North America but lasts for seven years over in Europe? That's the same one, yeah. Okay? And this is very interesting because in the Seven Years' War, we've covered this before, just to recap, Seven Years' War, how long did it last? Oh, okay, that was an easy one. When did it finish? <laughs> After seven years. <laughs> what year did it finish? I just gave that one to you. 1763. By 1763, the Seven Years' War is over. What were two European countries that were on opposite sides of the Seven Years' War? Britain versus France, very good, okay? And in Europe, they had Britain and France, and I think there was like Russia was on one side for a while, and then the Russian uh, king was kind of a dope, remember him? Yeah, and he's like, oh, I, I don't, can't be fighting Prussia. He's too cute. I'm like, oh my God, seriously? <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so that's the Seven Years' War in Europe, okay? And, that, and they, they ultimately ended the Seven Years' War in Europe, and like, who won? I don't know, it's over. But in North America, write this down, the Seven Years' War was won by Britain and its colonists, okay? The Seven Years' War was referred to in North America as the French and Indian War, which is a weird name for the war. If you wanted to be accurate, you would call it the French and Indians versus the British and colonists. Although remarkably, there actually were some Indian tribes that were in favor of the British. as it takes place in North America. So think of it, that's why sometimes people, historians are like, oh, it's kind of like the First World War, because they were fighting in Europe, and they were fighting over in India. The British and the French were fighting in India, and the British won there. And they were fighting in North America, and the British won in North America. So did that answer it? It's the same war, but I would refer to it, most often when you're talking about American history, we refer to it as the French and Indian War. Okay. But it's the same time period. And why would the Indians mostly favor the French in that conflict? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because if the French win, I mean, the French are like, if we got to keep this land, we're going to hunt. You know, we'll, we'll trap, we'll get stuff but we're not going to bring in a whole bunch of Frenchies to settle up and down. Whereas if the British get it, 
what potentially could take place if the British get hold of all this land? More colonists. More colonists. Write that down. The British win with the help of colonial militias. And one of the commanders of the Virginia colonial militia was a young George Washington. Way to go, George Washington. Woohoo! Good job, George. But I tell you what, if it hadn't been for the British Army and the British Navy, I don't know that the war would have turned out that same way. If it's just the colonists versus Native Americans and the French troops, I don't know if the colonists would have won. Keep that in mind. Yeah, just the militia. I don't think they would have done it. But boy, the Native Americans aren't very happy about that. The poor French, the French military is kicked out of Canada. You still got French speakers up there in Quebec. You do have some of them in an area called Acadia, and they're stuck on boats and sent all the way down to New Orleans and Louisiana, and they are, are going to be referred to not so much as Acadians, but as Cajuns. Have you ever heard of Cajuns? Yeah, so they're like French Canadians. After that war, they were deported to the French territory in Louisiana, and they still have like Cajun culture and so forth there. It's very interesting. But here's the kicker. 1763, write this down. Because this is where the video starts, and we're going to be picking that up uh, as soon as we lay out enough notes for you. 1763, the colonists love Britain. They love everything about Britain. They love the language. They love, they love the autonomy. They love being able to run their own show. They love when the British come in and provide their military at a really key opportune moment to beat the French and the Native Americans. They love it because then the French and the Native Americans are mostly out of the way. Certainly the French are out of the way. There will be some more fights with the Native Americans over time, but the French are out of the way. And so what can those new colonists do, the new arrivals? Exactly, they can expand. And they're like, yes, we can grow, we can move to the West. They're so happy. Everyone's so happy. It's all working out very well. Yeah, it's like, what could go wrong? In fact, it's very interesting. Make sure you write this down. Those 13 colonies that we mentioned, they didn't really know each other that well. They're like, what? They're all part of North America. Did the people, like in the southern colonies, interact much with the people in the northern colonies? Not much. Merchants and so forth did. But you didn't really go there. If you were going to go anywhere to, like, for like some really cool trip or to educate your kid if you could afford it and so forth, back to Britain. So there's more communication back to Britain. You don't have all these like turnpikes and roads and so forth. They mentioned in the video that it takes like a couple of weeks to go from Boston to New York. Are you kidding me? In good traffic today on a highway, you can get from Boston to New York in like, I don't know, six hours or something, maybe less. They, the roads were terrible. Honestly, if you're going to go from Boston to New York, you might as well just take a boat because that'll be like a more gentle, you know, trip. Or Boston to Philadelphia or Boston to Charleston. Go on a boat. So, yeah. Here's the deal. They like things. People, write this name down. George Washington. He's from Virginia. Let's go ahead and introduce George Washington. By the way, you've heard George Washington, right? Right? Can you answer this question? Are you ready? Because you're going to think this is a rather strange question. Raise your hand if you can tell me, who's the first president of the United States of America? Wrong. <laughs> He's the first president of the United States of America under the United States Constitution, elected in 1789, inaugurated in 1790, and serves ultimately eight years. Oh, you want to give it another try? Hudson? Hanson. Yeah. Before I put the picture up there and so forth, I would say, who's the first president of the United States? And they were like, and I might answer, me. I spell my name differently, H-A-N-S-E-N. John Hanson was the first president of the United States under the previous version of the United States government that ended up not working out very well. We'll get into those details and so forth later on. So he's not known very well. He's a man from Maryland. When I grew up in Virginia, high school friends of mine would go, hey, you got a highway named after you in Maryland. I'm like, what? Yeah, there's John Hanson Highway in Maryland. I'm like, that's weird. Who's John Hanson? I don't know, but he's got a highway <laughs> named after him. 
he presided for a little while along with like seven other men, some of whom were much more famous, like John Hancock.